All right, well, we're, we're cooking with uh, fish grease here. So that's good. And we'll get started to do our thing for us. So uh, let me just get going here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, no matter where you're watching us from around the globe. I say thank you for allowing us into your homes, most importantly, in your hearts. If you're watching us today on the DBNA Television Network, a sincere thank you and continue to support this wonderful network, which is one year old, plus the other amazing talent and outstanding sponsors. If you're listening to us in podcast form today, Billy and I say, turn that knob up. Let us put a little Hoosier hospitality in your ear. We're going to have fun with this. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to lace them up once again with another edition of the Coach Scott Field Show. Today is going to be a lot of fun. We're just a couple Hoosier boys sitting around the water cooler talking all things Indiana and Indiana basketball. This is host of Keeping the Nostalgia Alive, Billy Powell. Billy, how are you today, brother? Man, I'm fantastic. It's weird to be on the other end. <laughs> yeah, so you're usually you're asking all the questions so to sit, today you get to sit back and uh let me pick your brain for a little bit love your show that you do uh, being an indiana guy myself uh graduating from lewis cass high school i believe you are a broad ripple rocket so uh let's kind of get into that a little bit uh yes i am a broad ripple rocket i graduated there from 1986 um, I was not a very good basketball player. So what that meant was, as you know, you did managerial duties. You went to a Jack Kramer camp in Bloomington uh, down on the Indiana University campus and learned how to uh, wrap ankles, um, you know, do preventative medicine, you know, do that whole sports medicine gig, which I should have stayed in. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I did everything that I could to stay around the game. And, you know, since since I wasn't a good basketball player and I did all these other things, I got to be around a lot of great minds of basketball. I got to, I have a lot of stories that, you know, that, you know, that I just just soaked in. And uh, um, that's why I do what I do, you know, a few years ago thinking, you know, I need to keep the nostalgia alive, which my my wife came up with that uh, motto, which, uh, you know, I got to throw a, a bone out to her. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, Broderick, of course, won the. Um, 1980 state championship by beating um, New Albany, the New Albany Bulldogs, who were 27 and 0. Uh, Stacy Turan, who went on to play for the Los Angeles Raiders and also be an All American at Notre Dame, hit a 57 foot shot that beat Marion, so the Indian uh, that brought up B into that championship game. And then when I came to Broderpool in '82, in the basketball season '82 to '83, I think I saw one of the greatest games ever in Indiana high school basketball, which was. Broad Ripple and Newcastle and Steve Alford scored 57 points, went 25 for 25 from the free throw line. And of course, Broad Ripple lost in that game. But just what a what a great game to be a part of. Man, it, you know, when I, I sit there and hear you tell these stories, I think of the names that you're dropping and you just think Hoosier hysteria. I mean, come on, we we you and I, we we graduated 86. So we got to play when there was no three point line and we played when there was no classification in Indiana basketball. How much do you feel that helped, you know, catapult you and what you currently do? Because again, it was big versus the small. The movie Hoosiers was based off of, you know, non classification basketball, the Milan State Champions. How did that kind of trigger what you do? Ah, man, it, you know, it, it's something that, you know, it is what it is now with class basketball. Yeah. No matter what you do, it, it ain't going back. And, you know, there's been a lot of great state championship teams that have won it in, in the class basketball situation. But I think both you and I were lucky by going through that and, and you know, appreciating what it was. You know, a, a lot of these things are going to be forgotten. You know, as uh, people get older, as people pass away, those things are going to be forgotten and kind of go back to what I was saying earlier. That's why, you know, I like to get a lot of these guys um, on audio or on video. Um, I've had several of my guests pass away. Oh, yeah. And do you know what the, I had uh, just recently? I had, uh, uh, oh, Eric Harmon passed away. He was in the movie Blue Chips. He was the official in Blue Chips. He was a Big Ten official and did all kinds of stuff in baseball um, in the state of Indiana and was a fabulous official. And his daughter 
after he had passed, I posted the show that I did of him a couple of years ago. His daughter loved it, hadn't, had never heard it, didn't know the, some of the stories. So that kind of, that kind of uh, uh, makes me feel good. That, that makes me feel good about what I do. You know what? It, it helps keep the legacy alive and keeps the stories alive and keeps, it keeps a, a, a finger on the pulse of, of what happened because to, to know where you're going, you got to know where you've come from and you get to keep most of that Hoosier hysteria, you know, at the forefront. Yeah. And, you know, it's, you know, what's the old adage, you know, those who don't study history tend to repeat it. So, you know, and I know that doesn't work in what we're, what we're doing, but, you know, it's, I tell you, I just, I, I entertain myself by doing these things. You know, I, 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 I love posting it and loving comments come back, but I sit there for an hour or hour and a half sometimes listening to these stories from coaches or listening to their uh, uh, personal uh, experiences with the game of basketball. And I, I'm entertained. I'm enthralled. I, mean, I have a concentration headache by the end of some of these interviews. <laughs> that, and it's so fun. You know, you, you're talking about, you know, being at Broad Ripple and you think of some of the talent that has gone through that program, you know, at different sports. But I, first of all, I, I think of George Hill immediately, who's playing in the NBA now, who was a broad ripple rocket correct me if i'm wrong that is correct and the big thing going on right now is the indiana hoosiers are back and mike woodson was a broad ripple rocket that's exactly right i mean the two, two of the the well-known names and to have coach woodson come back and infuse some of that old uh old coach night kind of you know kind of connect the generations because you think of the success that coach Knight had and now you got Mike Woodson who's you know had great success in the NBA great friends with you know we're, we're a lot of common acquaintances but to see him come back and in, infuse that excitement and reconnect some of the 1970s uh you know to you know the 2020s it, it's a good thing for Indiana basketball oh it's a fabulous thing and I you know They've had a couple of tough, tough losses this year that, you know, their record would be slightly better, especially they should have beat uh, Wisconsin at Wisconsin. They should have beat Syracuse uh, before they went into overtime and lost them. So there's another couple of victories, that, which makes it 18. But, you know, and I knew they were going to be there. Were, I knew there was going to be a little bit of downtime after you had such a great game against the Purdue Boilermakers, which they had their act. The Purdue Boilermakers, well coached and great basketball program also. But no, it's a. Uh, uh, seeing Mike doing what he's doing, it's, it's, it, I know this sounds silly, but it's, you feel, I feel like one of my kids, <laughs> I'm proud of one of my kids, you know, out there. Uh, uh, I'm very proud of him and proud that he was a broad of a rocket. And I'm proud that I went to broad high school. Also. What, what kind of stories did you hear of Mike Woodson, you know, at broad ripple? Well, you know, Mike Woodson also played with Don Cox, Don yeah, Cox, Cox Unfortunately, Don Cox was one of those players that was uh, kicked off the team in 77 because of uh, there was several there was a whole team shakeup in 77 with Coach Knight. Uh, but, uh, you know, with Don Cox and Mike Woodson on the same team, they should have actually won a state championship. But that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier is that, you know, the broader pool sectional was Hinkle. So we play at Hinkle Fieldhouse every sectional. And the eight to how many ever teams there were in that sectional every year, you'd beat up on each other. There, there, there should be several state champions to come out of Hinkle, but because you only one person gets to come out of that sectional, you know, that's what's so tough in all these regions. I, I've talked to people that uh, um, uh, Dave Magley, who played uh, up at uh, South Bend LaSalle, uh, Mr. Basketball in 1978, uh, uh, people from the uh, Gary area, people from the Anderson area, you know, those teams just beat up on each other and only one person can come out of it. Yeah. And, and see, you mentioned 1978 and, you know, Dave Magley, who is now the president of the TBL, the basketball league, which is a minor league um, that plays throughout the United States with more than 40 teams. But in 1978, where I played my high school basketball, that's when Ted and John Kitchell started at Lewis Cass, which were the first ever sectional champions that went on to play the Marion Giants in regional play. So already you just start thinking about Indiana basketball and just how rich it is and just where it's come from. It's just it's just so fun to talk about those, you know, glory days. 
It is, it is. And what's interesting too, like I said, me being a sponge, I brought up a high school. I was in the athletic director's office. Who's the athletic director was Gene Ring, played for Branch <laughs> McCracken. Branch, coached, wow. Coached for Branch McCracken. Uh, was a uh, Big Ten uh, All-American in baseball, is in the Indiana University Athletics Hall of Fame. He was our athletic director. And wow. I, I, I wish I would could go back now and, and pick his brain. He played for John Wooden up at South Bend before John Wooden went to Indiana State University to coach. Right. Um, but I'm in his, the athletic director's office, um, and this gentleman knocks on the door, walks in, eh, about 6'3", maybe 6'4", and uh, a nice gentleman. He's in row sporting goods. And I said, can I help you? He said, I'm looking for Gene. I said, oh, he stepped out. Uh, probably be back about a half hour, 45 minutes. Anything I can do for you? Well, just tell him Rick Mount stopped by. <laughs> Now, now, what's interesting is my dad hated sports, but he would tell me stories about going to the Indiana State Fairgrounds and watching the Pacers and Rick Mount play and how good of a basketball player Rick Mount was. So I'm sitting there going, wow, this is cool. So, you know, and then I got to use that story to Rick to get him to come on the st- on the show. Oh. So, you know, that, you know, just, you know, going and playing uh, George Griffith at Richmond. Uh, the old Richmond gym in Richmond, Indiana, they've now t- turned it into, I'm going to probably um, screw this up, the Tiernan Center, I think now in Richmond, um, which is an 8,000 seat uh, um, gym. But, uh, you know, uh, playing at uh, uh, the old Richmond uh, gym, you know, it, oh gosh, the stories are just, I can go on and on and on. <laughs> it's like peeling an onion, man. You just keep going and going. But think about, you know, Rick Mount, what were some of the stories he shared with you that resonated with you? Uh, he was really disappointed that he didn't sign the ten thousand dollar deal, deal to wear pro kits. Oh wow! But no, you, you know Rick Mount is one of those people that if you don't know him, he comes off a little cocky. But you're Rick Mount. You you can be a little bit cocky because you did what you needed to do. You 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 are he. I mean, shoot, he's on my top five, top six list of the. Uh, greatest basketball play- players to come out of the state of Indiana. So, you know, <laughs> um, I, the best story of Rick Mount, though, was him telling me about how one of the managers came up to him and he said, he's, where, where's everybody at? And he said, oh, the, well, they're having a meeting. And Rick goes, well, well I'm on the team. What, what are they having a meeting about? And Rick tells me, the manager says, well, they're, they're talking about whether or not they want to pass you the ball. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's that's hilarious! Yes. And, and, you know, you think of Rick Mount, you think of that that career he had at Purdue University. You know, going on playing in the ABA, just you know, you think of phenomenal shooter, and you, you know, and I think of like in the '60s where my dad will tell me stories of you know Jimmy Rail, you know, being Mister Basketball up at Kokomo, Indiana, with the Wildcats, and you just think there's just so much basketball and, and then you think John Wooden coaching and the great players but I heard you say you know you have a list of you know the top five or six players but in your opinion who are the top five in all-time Indiana high school basketball players and, and you know this is this will be argued you know it, it's just oh, like it's just like it's the subjective. greatest it's just like the greatest NCAA basketball team of all time Sports Illustrated voted uh, Indiana's 1976 perfect season is that you're going to get people that went to UCLA to say, no, their perfect seasons were that, you know, so it's very objective and, you know, it's a rough list to do, but, you know, I I have Oscar at number one. Oh, the big O. I mean, and, and what he's done. Christmas addicts. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and what he did for the game of basketball, a lot of people don't know what he did for the, uh, uh, the NBA and the players and, and their pay and what goes on with that right now. All Um, the triple doubles. Oh my goodness. Yes, uh, a Big Mac, George McGinnis. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, people don't realize that this guy could play professional football instead. Right. But what but what a career, uh, what a career he had. Um, Larry Bird, you know, you know, we all hear the story Rich of Larry Rick, Bird not, want, not <laughs> wanting to go into the all-star game at trash time. And, you know, Kirby Overman, who won the 1973 state championship in New Albany, you know, you know, said going in and Larry's like, nope, I'm not going in, you know. And, you know, let's see who else. I got Sean Kemp. Oh, okay. Yeah. Damon Bailey, Rick Mount. You know, those are wow. those are all hovering around there. And, you know, that list is uh, fluid, too, because there, there are so many great names that do come out of the state of Indiana. 
Yeah, because think of Sean Kemp and his athleticism. And let me see, what was it, Concord, Concord High School? Or right. correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, and then you think, you know, he goes off to a junior college, I think Trinity Valley, and then, of course, ends up in the NBA and then has the phenomenal years with uh, Coach George Carl and with Gary Payton. I mean, it just it just goes on and on. And what a great list you've got there. And then Steve Alford, I mean, look at the success that he had. And, you know, he and Damon Bailey are, I hear, arguably played in front of the biggest, you know, state championship crowds that there were in tournament times. Uh, that is true. I think there were like 41,000 and change at the Damon Bailey's Final Four when he won the state championship. I think it was 1990. Wow. But, uh, you know, and, 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 and not to go back, but when Broderpool played Newcastle in the semi state, Indianapolis Broderpool, we thought we had the advantage because. We're in the Indianapolis semi-state. Come out yeah. and support. Come out and support Broderpool, who's from Indianapolis. I think there were 15 buses from. A matter of fact, if you would have been a good thief, you would have just stayed in Newcastle and you could have robbed homes all day because I think every <laughs> citizen of Newcastle was in uh, Hinkle Fieldhouse uh, on that day. But see that that's what Indiana basketball is all about. Those small towns, the sense of community. I mean, all the barber shop talk. I mean. And again, the movie Hoosiers depicts a lot of that, even though they just kind of skim it. But man, that's that's how we grew up with our basketball. To me, more of a golden era, you know, before classification, but it's just an opinion. But I think there were so many great life lessons that were taught from non-classification basketball, because if you just went to a small country school playing against a big inner city school, I mean, that was, you know, to go into those gyms, that was something to behold it was and you know what's interesting you bring up hoosiers i have an interesting story i'm not hijacking uh, your interview no but please we, we were to play chatard on saturday night at chatard and chatard and broderpool are about a mile and a half apart so we were rivals chatard being a catholic parochial school uh, us being a public school and the athletic director came to coach smith and said uh they they're filming a movie in Hinkle and they want to have the game tonight between Broadport and Chatard at Hinkle. Would you guys be okay with that? So we had a team vote and everybody voted that was cool and that was okay. So we went there and we played Chatard on the Hinkle at Hinkle Fieldhouse. And then at halftime, that's when they filmed the championship scenes of the movie Hoosiers. Oh, see, that's 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 saucy right there. And when you think of Hinkle Fieldhouse, my goodness, the home of Butler University. But, you know, in that movie, Hoosiers, come on, you you had, you know, the PA announcer was, you know, who we grew up listening to on the radio. So, I mean, Tom, Car I mean, I mean, drop some of those names on us. Oh, you had uh, Tom Hilliard uh, Gates, Tom <laughs> Hilliard Gates, Tom Carnegie. You had you had uh, uh, as the opposing coach, of course, everybody's seen the movie Hoosiers. Uh, most people more than a dozen times. Um, I have people saying, you know, what well, for my 156 times I watched Hoosiers last night. But no, um, you had uh, um, the coach of, um, oh man, I'm losing his name right now, of, um, of Addicts teams uh, as the opposing uh, coach in the final game. Um, you know, so the, 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 it, it was really, really fun. Uh, now, it wasn't packed like it was at the 1983 semi state with about 14,000 people there. But they did a really good job in filming that so that, you know, and, and Gene Hackman has said in several interviews that they were worried that they weren't going to have enough people uh, there for that evening. But um, uh, but what a but what a great experience. I You know, if I'd have known more about what they were doing, uh, I, I would have got more involved with it. But, you know, it, the things that, you know, didn't know then that, you know, then you, now you just, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Right. And you think I've seen some recent social media posts where, you know, Gene Hackman just turned 92 years old. And you think of, man, I bet the stories that he could tell, you know, just by that short time being here in Indiana, going through those small towns where, you know, you had the tear hewn, you know, where, where Jim, Jimbo Rail actually played, you know, since his dad was Mr. Basketball that I mentioned earlier with from Kokomo that who I got to know a little bit. And again, just just the level of basketball and basketball knowledge and what Hoosier hysteria is all about. And you and I had this conversation uh, last week where we talked about, you know, the some of the largest gymnasiums in the United States are right there in the state of Indiana. 
Yeah, I think nine out of the 10 uh, uh, are in Indiana. There's another one, I think, in Dallas, Texas. But, you know, they don't know anything about basketball here in Texas. <laughs> but, but uh, uh, you know, uh, while attending Broad Apple High School, we went down to scout uh, uh, Newcastle one game my senior year. I got to go one uh, down to the uh, uh, Chrysler Fieldhouse, Newcastle Stadium, whatever they call it now. And, uh, oh, my gosh, just to walk around that place, you know, that's another one of those you know stories that it, 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 were basketball crazy in the state of indiana right if the walls could talk right right <laughs> you know the marion teams playing there at newcastle against steve alford cathedral going there and playing you know it's a it's a and and it's sad to see what's happened to you know it's sad number one that there's was a lot of consolidation which we know we lost a lot of high schools because of consolidation and uh, it's just, um, ah, I just, you know, it's, that's, that's why I do what I do to keep the nostalgia alive. So, you know, people will remember those. Right. Well, you know, in, in talking about old gymnasiums, I, I think of the Peru Tigers arena where Kyle Macy played. I remember being a sophomore playing for Lewis Cass High School, playing against the Peru Tigers. And I think, I think it was my sophomore year. I think I went eight for 10 from the from the floor that night, but just playing in that old gym where, you know, the stadium seats were real in close. So you had that intimate feel from the fans. I just, just great, great basketball. Yes. And you know what, the, the Vincennes Adams Coliseum with the uh, uh, Coliseum where the Vincennes Alice's play was another one of those fantastic gymnasiums. But I loved how they would. I loved how they had it set up, and Anderson Highland had it set up. They had the opposing team bench at the end of the baseline. Yeah, you, know, you were you were on the side like normal. You know what I'm saying? So it was <laughs> yeah. a little bit of a dis. I think it was a little bit of a ploy for a little bit of advantage home team cooking there, uh, where they would put you on the back of that. But Vincennes Coliseum, uh, Gary Roosevelt. You know, another one of those, you go to a basketball, we went to a basketball game there twice while I was at Broadapol, and just the, the, the sta- 8,000 people. You oh, know? man. It, people it, have too many choices nowadays. That's why uh, the schools, and you know, uh, um, uh, my hat's off to a lot of these schools like Lagodi, uh, which has a uh, fabulous reputation in high school basketball, Jack Butcher. Uh, uh, Michael Wagner, who won the state championship finally for them. Uh, but, uh, you know, their gyms are filled every Friday and Saturday night. But, you know, there, there's too many choices for some of these kids nowadays. Uh, yeah. So, you know. Well, I, I think of like, again, the late 70s at my high school when Ted and John Kitchell, of course, Ted went on. I mean, he was he was with that um, Indiana basketball all stars with Dave Magley when he was Mr. Basketball. I wanted to say he wore number five, but he went on to play for Bobby Knight at Indiana University, and then his cousin John went and played at Purdue University, uh, you know, with with Coach Katie, and I, I just think that the, the pep clubs and the the just the pep band, how that whole student section was completely packed, and we had two levels on both sides. It was standing room only, and just that whole atmosphere, how great it was, because if I couldn't be at the game in person and watching them. I mean, I, I had them on the radio and I was playing Nerf hoop in my hallway, you know, trying to emulate what I was hearing uh, from the announcers, but just great, great basketball. And then you mentioned Anderson a second ago, one of my former players who I actually went to Kokomo High School and recruited from Coach Basil Mobby, who you and I had a discussion about, is now the head coach of the, of the Anderson team that now, and they're having great success. So it's like, you know, it's just passing the passing the baton and passing the torch and seeing these players go back to, you know, continue to impact their communities. You just got to be so proud of that. Oh, yes. And, you know, you, you're just saying a lot of those things. You can tell me you were standing on those sidelines while you were at Lewis Cass and they would play the national anthem oh. and or the Star Spangled Banner and you would get goosebumps. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. And, and our pet club, they they did this rendition of America that they would acapella sing before the national anthem. And then uh, Roger Schnepp was the head coach when Ted and John played. And they played what was 
we called the Schnepp song, but it was Rock and Roll Part 2, which you hear at most Coliseum and arenas now. So, oh my gosh, you better believe, you know, you would have goosebumps, the hair would stand up. And that's what I think instilled the passion and the love of basketball for me, because I was blessed to quarterback all four years in high school. I set you know, I think I've got two records in track now and competed to the state in long jump. But basketball, there was just something about basketball that I knew that that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my life because of that impact that it had on me, you know, in my preteen years in the 70s with those crowds. Yes. And, you know, uh, like I said earlier with uh, Gene Rang, who played at IU and played for Branch McCracken, coach for Branch McCracken, um, uh, what a guy who kind of uh, lit my fire. And another guy oh. who lit my fire was Coach Bill Smith, who finally this past year, uh, this upcoming March, will be inducted into the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. But wow. uh, he was a, he was another uh, uh, remarkable gentleman in my lifetime that uh, kind of, uh, you know, kept that flame burning and, and made me do what I continue to do. What was it about coach? Because I, I hear, it, 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 I mean, I get chills here and you talk about it because you're talking so passionately, but what was it about coach that made it special? Man. He told you like it was. Okay. No he, fluff. he told you what it was going to be like. He told you like what, what it was, what it was. And he told you what it was going to be like. And he taught you how to handle it when you get to that point. Oh. And, and, and to all of his players, to all of his students, I mean, he, he was just a, a, a and, and also too, a wouldn't take anything from anybody. Wow. Yeah. Anything from anybody. So, you know, he had the respect of his players and he had the respect of his students and uh, you wanted a compliment out of him or you wanted him to say something. That's what your goal was to work toward. Yeah. And, but, but just the respect that he taught was just, was just incredible. So is it fair to say that he was one of the biggest impacts on your young life? You know, I, I was, my mom passed away when I was six years old and I went to live with my aunt Trinita and uncle Fred in Hallville, which is about a mile down from the Indianapolis 500. And we would go to the Washington continental games. So it kind of started with John Sherman Williams, who went on to have a great and outstanding career at Indiana State University and in this upcoming March is going to be inducted into the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. So it kind of started with that. And then the, the Gene Ring and then the Coach Smith. Um, and then there was another gentleman who uh, was the varsity assistant coach and baseball coach, uh, Thomas Renchi, who kind of uh, uh, was was kind of my um, uh, biggest influence with that with that. But I just became a like a force gump or a rain man with 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 basketball knowledge. And, you know, I, I wrote for the newspaper, the high school newspaper, and of course, Broadway High School now, I think it's been closed. This is coming up on four years. Uh, but uh, I enjoyed athletics. And I think mostly, too, it's because I wasn't very good at that. Was do you think with those coaches and with some of those players and some of the people that that you looked up to, was that more of a draw into the game for you? You know what it was? And you know what was what's even more interesting? I can expound like, for example, Marty Eichelbarger, who coached at Rebuff, Princeton, uh, Heritage Hills, Frankfurt. Um, he, I got to see him three, four times in my four years at Broderpool. And he left an impression on me on how he coached his kids. Um, um, uh, Basil Sofredo at Washington, um, Tom O'Brien at Cathedral, um, wow. uh, Larry Humes was coaching at Attics. I, I, I mean, we're sitting on the end of the bench and, you know, someone's going, yeah, that's Larry Humes. Oh, all right, who's Larry Humes? You know, <laughs> I got a quick education on who Larry Humes was. So, you know, um, uh, all these places that, you know, uh, uh, you know, Basil Malby, you know, all these places that, uh, you know, eh, you know, there, there are so many eh, eh, six degrees of separation. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, six Is degrees he, of separation. You mentioned Coach Basil Malby. He had great years and then he actually got to go coach the high school that I graduated from several years after I had already left. But it was always interesting, you know, to see him take his philosophy and take the talent that he had and try to mold that into be successful to be, you know, state recognized every stop he had, he, he had success. 
You know, I would also be wrong not to mention that we got the Indianapolis Star. We got the Indianapolis News. The Star would come in the morning. The news would come in the evening. And I was glued to that paper, looking at box scores, reading the work of uh, uh, Bob Collins, re reading the book of uh, reading the work of Bob Collins, reading the work of Jimmy Angelopoulos, reading the work of Mark Schneider, uh, oh. uh, Jim Russell. You know, so you know, getting those two newspapers and just you know being, I, I became a historian of the, of the game before I actually even learned about the game. Oh, see, I love that. And, and here we're dating ourselves because we're talking about newspapers. There's not there's not a lot of print that's left out there because of so much social media now. But I think the fact that we got to grow up in that, I can remember it was always so exciting after a game to be curious to see what the writers or, you know, what the columnists, what they were saying about certain teams or certain players, because that's how I gauged myself. Okay. Who do I need to be ready for? Who do I need to get, you know, who, who do I need to know a little bit better? And man, what would we do without those wonderful writers back in the day? Oh, in the same way with the uh, uh, newscasters, yeah. you know, Ed Harding, uh, Larry, uh, um, uh, 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 Dick Ray, um uh Lee Owens, Don Hine. Um Don I'm, I'm, Hine, that's right. Don Hine. I mean, I know I'm probably uh, Brian Hammonds, you know, j just those kind of people who would uh, report on uh games and and you, you know, and and of course WTTV did a great job with having the uh, Indiana basketball and Purdue basketball on. I, I will say that in Indiana, unfortunately, you're kind of raised to be a Purdue fan or an Indiana fan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, I was raised to be an Indiana fan by my uncle, Fred. He loved Bobby Knight. I mean, of course you can see Bobby there behind me. If you look closely. Right. Um, right. But um, you know, after doing this five, six, seven, eight years, it's appreciation for all things basketball, you know, and you, I, I delve into uh, the Purdue teams, you know, starting with Rick Mount, you know, and, and, you know, it, uh, Dave Shellhouse, who was an All-American there, uh, came out of Evansville North, um, uh, you know, uh, was a, a top, it was a first round draft pick for, first uh, draft pick for the Chicago Bulls. So it's, it, once again, man, it goes back to six degrees of separation, newspaper, print, media, and, and those things are kind of, uh, there's too much to choose from nowadays. <laughs> and see, when you talk about TTV4, I think of that's who hosted the Bobby Knight show, early Saturday mornings for us. And we always had the old console TV and we're listening to Bobby Knight talk about the last game, the upcoming game, and he'd bring a player on. I mean, to to my dad, he was God. And then when I was at Chaminade University coaching out in Hawaii and they came, came out to the Maui Invitational, Bobby Knight brought his Hoosiers out there. I know my dad was cheering against me, against Bobby Knight. <laughs> Oh my gosh, good stuff. Oh, as you sit there and you're talking, it just triggers so many thoughts and so many memories. Who are some of your favorite guests that on your Keeping Nostalgia Live? Who are some of your favorite guests and why? You know, uh, Kent Benson was one of my favorites. Ooh. You know, big man, you know, yes. dominant part of that perfect. The nicest guy, you know, the nicest guy that you can ever and would do anything for you. Um, Rick Mount. I really enjoyed the stories with Rick Mount just because once I graduated from Indiana State University with my history degree, I started working in retail and started working for the finish line. And Rick wandered into Lafayette Square one day and all of a sudden I'm selling him basketball shoes for the next three years while I'm at the finish line. The Rick <laughs> Mount interview was fun. Um, uh, oh, man. Marianne Davis. Bobby Knight's assistant. Wow. For like 35 years. There's my, a perspective for you. Yeah. One of, one of my favorite. Uh, they received a box in the mail because they were looking for assistant coaches and there was a left arm in it. It was a, it was a fake left arm, but the letter said he would give his left arm to be an assistant for Bobby Knight. So that was one of those quick stories. Now I will tell wow. you this is that I had coach Gene Katie on the show. But man, some of these, sometimes you've got to just take a deep breath. You got to relax, not drink the coffee or not have the energy drink before you do the interview. Because I was a little, I was a little nervous about the Gene Katie interview. Uh, but, you know, uh, was the list goes. He was a football, football player before. What, 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 made you, what made you nervous about that interview? I don't know. It's uh, because you saw uh, how he coached. 
Okay. And you know, you, you that number growl one, you on the you, sideline. Yeah, you didn't want to, you know, you didn't want him to take off his jacket. You didn't, you didn't want to be late calling in. And you know, you don't, you know, a lot of these guys have a lot of other better things to do than spend time talking to a a, a broader rocket who's, you know, just starting a, a show out. But but they're kind <laughs> enough to do the show. But uh, Gene Cady was kind of uh, uh, a little bit, um, um, uh, what, what's a intense or uh, you know, I was a little nervous, but. Uh, uh, man, uh, the list goes on and on. There, there are a couple of interviews. It's hard. I'm, I, I, I'm assuming you have the same issues when you're talking to somebody and they just answer your question and then they're done talking. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, John what? Wellemeyer was one of those guys I had on the show. And, uh, you know, he, he just answered your questions and you're like, oh man, I got to find another question. So he, he wouldn't here. elaborate for you. And you're like, We're, oh man, come on. You're making me sweat over here. <laughs> right, right. And everybody was pretty good too. You know, you get, you still get a lot of the old cliches and, and no one gives you a little bit more dirt than, than you need. But uh, um, Wayne Boltinghouse, I don't know if you know who Wayne Boltinghouse is, but he told me a story about when he was playing minor league baseball with the St. Louis Cardinals and uh, uh, Stan Musial uh, uh, hit wow. his, uh, uh, his uniform one day. You know, so, you know, uh, those are the kind of uh, uh, ones that you uh, feel really good about and enjoy. My favorite interviews are the ones where I walk away and I've really learned something. And, you know, it was on a personal basis. Billy Keller was a great interview. Oh, um, a very humble guy. Bob Nettolicki, who played for the Indiana Pacers. Yeah. Great interview. George McGinnis. Oh, Bobby Slick Leonard. Oh, boom, baby. <laughs> yeah, Bobby Slick. And, and for these, you know, and it's, you know, you, you think I'm sitting here talking to you right now in, in my in my office. But, you know, I talked to Big Mac and Slick, you know, while I was dog sitting my my uh, kids uh, dogs <laughs> while they were on their honeymoon in, in a back bedroom. So it, it was kind of weird where you were doing it. But, you know, uh, those the interviews with the Pacers. Uh, Mark Monteith is oh. another guy who's a good writer, writes for uh, yes. IndianaPacers.com. But the, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Right. I don't, you know, uh, the younger guys don't really expound as much. Much, You know, Luke Recker, um, uh, you know, they're, they're a little bit shorter. Tom Coverdale, a little bit shorter, but, but still sweet and still nice to uh, hear. Uh, it's a little bit interesting. You get more information from the ones that have been around a little bit longer because they want to share the stories and make sure that those stories are remembered also. Oh, see, I like that. You know, talking about Bobby Slick Leonard, what was your biggest takeaway from that interview? And, and what did you learn that you didn't already know before that interview? Well, you know, those players, like, for example, they wanted to, Everybody wanted the Indiana Pacers to draft Steve Alford. Oh, yeah, right. You know, we took Reggie Miller. Yep. It was a better decision. But uh, Bobby kind of talked a little bit about, you know, some uh, the pro game is different than the college game, which is different from the high school game. And it was interesting to hear his kind of perspective on, you know, you, you, when you're in the pro game, it's quickness. Yeah. You know, so and, uh, uh, you know, you, it. It just doesn't, it, it can't be a perfect scenario every time from high school yeah. to college to pro. Um, but Slick was really, really nice and really, really down to earth. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, see, I, it, when, you, when you're sharing those stories, I think of my time out at the NBA Summer League and, you know, we're sitting there up in the coaches section and, you know, there's a lot of scouts. And I remember talking with Mel Daniels and Mel was just a peach of a guy and kind of, kind of just very humble. He liked, you know, he didn't even really talk basketball a whole lot. He wanted to talk about his horses, his horse ranch. And I just will never forget how big his hands were when we would go to shake hands. I'd be like, Mel, great to see you again. How are you feeling? I know you've been under the weather, but man, he would, he would shake my hand and I'd feel like I was just happy to have my hand back because he was just such a big, massive, strong grip, but man, he loved his horses. And I had no idea how much he loved the horses until I'd spend that time with him out there. Oh, very interesting. Uh, someone who also had huge hands to me, and I, I have to tell you this story real quick, um, I, I, because I was a sports editor for the, for the Repairing Echo at Broadway High School. 
And the person who's run the scoreboard there at whatever the place is called now, used to be called Market Square Arena years ago, um, uh, has been running the scoreboard there for 35, 36 years. He got me some passes to take photos at the game. And uh, but it was the uh, 76ers were in town. OK. And here I am walking on the court and there's Dr. J. And I just start blurting out stuff to get an autograph. <laughs> He's with someone and he's talking with someone and he's kind of looks over at me and kind of goes, well, we're going to learn a lesson today. Number one, you're not going to interrupt adults when they're talking. Number two, number, number two when I get done, I'm going to give you the autograph, but we're going to learn today that you, know, you need to be a little bit patient and take your time and don't interrupt each other, uh, others while they're speaking. Great story. I mean, you're, you're talking about Julius Dr. J. Irving. Wow. Good story right there. Good. Story. I got to sit. I got to sit underneath the uh, basketball goal and take pictures one time while uh, uh, and Patrick Ewing fell on me. So, you know, <laughs> some of these stories, some of these stories I can't remember that I have, but, you know, you rolling this stuff out, they just kind of resurface and kind of um, uh, come to mind. Yeah. So what was one of the biggest shocks? that you had during one of your during one of your interviews and conversations that you're like i had no idea how to pronounce Haley bryant's name i wanted to call her hallie i call him hallie okay it was it was more embarrassing <laughs> and i did it twice and then i lost him you know harlem globetrotter uh indiana hoosier uh great ambassador to the game of basketball and i you know you know, kind of like Jim Rome. Jim Rome did it on purpose with Chrissy Everett. That's I right. Did, yeah. I didn't do it on purpose with, <laughs> with, with Haley Bryant. Oh, man. What you you telling that story. And, and before you were talking about Kent Benson. And and I, re, I always remember going to that one video where Kent Benson, you know, just coming into the league. And he gives Kareem Abdul-Jabbar a, just a big old elbow, you know, right in the side. And, and then Kareem kind of collects himself after he, you know, gets gets the wind knocked out. And Kareem goes over and just, just clocks Kent. I always wondered what was going through Kent's mind. When, when that big fist came around and he got hit by Kareem on the baseline. Now, you know, when I did start this out, I, you know, I don't want, and, and I hate to continue to use Jim Rome's name, but I didn't, yeah. I didn't want to be that way. I don't, you know, yeah. I want to, I want to, I want people to listen to my show on the merits of, you know, I want to listen to this guy that he's interviewing. And um, so I, I could have asked Kent Benson about that. I could have asked Rudy Tomjanovich, who has nothing to do with oh, Indiana basketball, but right. played for Michigan, played in the Big Ten, played against Rick Mount. So th those questions are there to ask and talk about. But, you know, uh, I, we didn't talk about uh, uh, his uh, drinking issues or, uh, you know, his years of sobriety. So, you know, there's kind of a, you know, I when chasing down these people, you know, I'll let them, you know, let them know, you know, no dumb questions, you know, just, uh, you know, um, you know, I, I, I don't want that. All, all I want is for people to hear, uh, uh, you know, how they were raised, how they got there, what do they do now? I mean, you know, so. I uh, see. And, and I like that because you and I had this conversation and this right here, none of this is scripted. This is basically raw and organic. And I feel like some of the best stories evolve from that. And to me, it's just fascinating that you've taken a passion and you've found a purpose and yet you've carved a niche into keeping these legacies alive. And I'll tell you what, I've, you know, I'm, I'm following you and I want you to share with our viewers and also the listeners, where can they find your work? Uh, well, they can find it at the Keeping the Nostalgia Live show on YouTube. You can just type in Keeping the Nostalgia Live show. It's going to come up, I promise you. Oh, yeah. um, and you can also go to anchor.fm backslash KTNA, which is keeping the nostalgia alive show. Uh, also, too, I, I have my hands in a lot of stuff. Uh, there's Indiana Basketball Memories, which has over 17,000 followers, subscribers on Facebook. Wow. There's Hoosier Hysteria. There's Baseball Keeping the Nostalgia Alive, Football Keeping the Nostalgia Alive, Basketball Keeping the Nostalgia Alive. That's awesome. That's I took it and I ran with it. I took it oh. and I ran with it. I love, I follow a lot of that content and I like how on your YouTube channel, how, you know, a lot of those old games will come up or these interviews. And I, I just, I don't know. It just, it just, you can take Indiana out of the boy, but you can't take, you know, the boy, I mean, take the boy out of Indiana, but you can't take Indiana out of the boy. And that's just me. And 
thank you for the content that you constantly put out there because to me it's just home it's roots and i think of you know going out in my backyard and looking for miles into a cornfield or a bean field and having my basketball go up there so you know if it wasn't for you billy i wouldn't have that 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 yearning for just home and and i can't thank you know that because i now live in salt lake city but man just all this indiana basketball tradition and history is so just woven into all your content and i love that well thank you i appreciate it it it, it is a passion that's for sure now if i can just figure out how to make money with it <laughs> there, there you go I, well i'm a fan and, and you know i encourage you know our viewers and our listeners to go give your stuff a look especially if you're from the midwest or if you're you know grew up around indiana sports and um i, I know that you know you also kind of involved with a lot of the uh a lot of the people who are now getting involved in the uh indiana sports hall of fame which i think is a great venture as well uh, yeah, and people, if it, uh, this is a legit real deal, man. Go to uh, in, inshof.com for Indiana Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, Tim Turpin is, wow. he's going to get this done. And it is a, you know, it is a, a sports hall of fame for everything from the state of Indiana. And it doesn't mean you had to come from the state of Indiana. Peyton Manning didn't come from the state of Indiana, but what he did for the state of Indiana makes Peyton Manning a member of the Indiana Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, it, we're trying to find property and build a building in Evansville. Um, there's a big awards uh, banquet because of COVID. Uh, the first three classes were kind of put off. That's going to be coming up this May 12th and 13th, I think. But you can get all those details at inshof.com. I have not gotten, I haven't gotten that down like I got KTNA. <laughs> <laughs> down pat so no but um, tommy fact, john tommy john is going to be there he's going to be one of the speakers during uh during that weekend so it's going to be an incredible there's going to be a silent auction with a lot of memorabilia given away but uh tim turpin with the um, indiana sports hall of fame has done good stuff and this this is going to be one of those things where uh you saw what the indiana basketball hall of fame was before it moved to newcastle uh but i think this is going to be the indiana sports hall of fame like the indiana basketball hall of fame is now in newcastle well, I, I'm, I'm eager to get Tim on to talk about that and, and bring awareness to what he's doing. We had a few technical difficulties last week. We were going to set it up, but we will have Tim come on because, again, uh, you just think of, I mean, whether it's golf or whether it's, you know, motorsports or baseball, basketball, man, I, I, just the things that he's doing. And again, with all that rich history and, and the names, I mean, it just it goes on and on. And I love that. Again, he's allowing those legacies to live on. Yes, he is. I want to tell you two things real quick. One was you asked me about my interviews. One was with Fritz Peterson, who swapped wives with another baseball player back in the 70s. I don't know if you remember this. No. Oh. He swapped wives and swapped children and swapped homes. That was very difficult to ask him why he did that. Oh, my goodness. So look up Fritz Peterson, people, and you'll get an interesting story Fritz about how two Peterson. people two people changed their wa swapped wives and kids and homes. Seriously, <laughs> legit. And then the other thing was me wanting to know why Tommy John always has hat was always crooked. Because you've seen Lou Pinella. Lou Pinella can't wear a cap without it looking like hat. And I asked Tommy John, I said, I mean, is, do, you, do you have just a weird size head? Or why does your baseball cap always look like it's getting ready to fall off? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's great stuff man and and i you think of the levels of things that you can get and i think i think you shared a story with me last week where you're talking about the pitcher that 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 had the big backside <laughs> yeah tim stoddard who's uh also going to be inducted into the indiana sports hall of fame is the only player to win an indiana high school basketball state championship a world series with the Baltimore uh, Orioles in 1983 and an NCAA basketball championship with the 1974 North Carolina State University Wolfpack. And he was in a movie called Rookie of the Year. And the, in Rookie of the Year, the pitcher who is in the game is leading off first base and starts saying, pitcher's got a big butt. So, and Tim Stoddard got to play the role of the pitcher with a big butt. And I asked him, I said, so do you really have a big butt? He kind of looked at me <laughs> first and then said, yeah, I do. I do, I'm a pretty big guy. 
<laughs> oh, good. See, again, that kind of content and your sense of humor and just the way that you go about your interviews, uh, I, I'm a fan, Billy, and I, I think you're doing a great job. Where where do you hope that it goes? I mean, are you are you hoping to maybe get picked up by a major network or what, what do you foresee with it? Well, I I would really, really, I've talked with Tim about this Indiana Sports Hall of Fame. I'd really like to be the curator of the museum because I think, oh, uh, wow. I, ju I just think that there's, you know, and, you know, there's just plenty of stuff to be able to get out there and get into a museum and keep the nostalgia alive and, and right. show what people, you know, I, and, you know, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I tried my hand at writing a book whatever you do, don't self-publish your own book and you're not going to become a millionaire. So, <laughs> <laughs> wow. But, but who knows, you know, and, and, but once again, I'm not Jim Rome where I'm calling you, you know, uh, uh, you know, Chrissy Everett across the table. So yeah, but, that's, uh, just, that's just clickbait now anyway. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I had this, I had this dream that I was going to be picked up by Mike Woodson as an assistant coach, but that hasn't happened yet at Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, great stuff! And you're you're living down. Aren't you just outside of Houston, Texas now? Uh, yes, uh, I have been down here for the past twenty five years, uh, and um, you know, just got down here and uh, never made it back to Indiana. We we'll go back to Indiana occasionally and um, see everything and reminisce and get new stories and people to be on the show. But uh, yeah, I've lived down here in Houston, Texas, where you know not a lot is known about the game of basketball, but they they can play a little bit of football. Although there I will is. say that Kelvin Sampson is doing a great job at the University of Houston for the Cougars. True, true. But but now that you're in Houston, what do you miss most about the state of Indiana? <sighs> Friends, okay. family. Also, too, what I miss most is that if I was back in Indiana now, a lot of these interviews that I would do may be one on one where I'm with the person or in with video rather than doing it, you know, uh, over the phone or doing it via video, you know, yeah. uh, being able to go and do a do a, uh, you know, go to Rick Mount's house. Oh, and that, you know what I'm saying? Or, right. or uh, I had the opportunity. Uh, I, uh, Jimmy Real wasn't uh, uh, at his best health. Um, he had had a stroke. Um, maybe I would have been at Jimmy Rail's house instead. Uh, we had to stop an interview and then we did it again on another day, which went fantastic because you know, from one day to the other, you know, you can switch around, change a little bit when you're when you're losing it a little bit. But, you know, I think being able to do a little bit one on one or going into people's homes or going into these venues where these stories, you know, like going last time I was there back last August, you going into Hinkle Fieldhouse. It was 15,000 people, man. It, it, now it's 8,000 seats. And that's all because of corporate greed and, you know, getting comfortable seats for people, season ticket holders to buy. And I, I'm not, I'm not upset at that, but you know, that's changed and it'd been an interesting story to be like, you know, uh, you know, then now, you know, 7,000 seats different uh, all because of, you know, how the game of basketball has changed. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, when when I think of, you know, I hear you say that, I think how cool would it be to get down to probably some of those old locker rooms and, and do an interview in one of the old locker rooms just because your senses, I mean, the smell, the, the, the water dripping off the pipes or just, you know, having him sit there on an old wood bench. I mean, that that right there is what it's all about, baby. Oh, man, are you kidding me? Uh, you go. I, you, I still say you can do this. You could you could uh, uh, blindfold me. And walk me into Hinkle, and I'd you I, I just take the blindfold. I could tell you before I could see it that I was at Hinkle Field. It just has this. Even now that they've taken the the pool out, I, I could tell you that I was in Hinkle Field House. And there was a smell about Broadway High School. There was a smell of all all these gyms we went into all the time. That uh, you know, very Good cool. Yes, stuff. yes, it's yeah. You know. Where's one? If you can have one place, your dream place to do an interview in the state of Indiana, where is it and why? Yeah. <laughs> well, I would probably be sitting center court with Mike Woods on one side and me on the other of the Indiana logo in the middle of Assembly Hall, Ooh. Uh, talking about stories about Coach Smith and what he meant to him and what he meant to me. I like it. I'll tell you what, Billy, great way to end the show. Ladies and gentlemen, again, Billy Powell, keeping the nostalgia alive. Look him up, subscribe to the channels, support it, follow the content. I know I do, and I'm not just saying this because he's on the show, but 
thrilled to have him on the Coach Scott Field Show just to share stories. Great work, my friend, and uh, thank you so very much for taking an hour out of your busy schedule and uh, sharing stories with, with our viewers and listeners here today, my man. Thank you so very much, and I look forward to hopefully maybe talking to you in the future. Let's do it. We can have a great time, my man. You did an outstanding job because I know it's a little different to uh, be on the other side of the mic this time. Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> You're a pro, my man. Ladies and gentlemen, again, Billy Powell, keeping the nostalgia alive. Uh, an outstanding show here with the uh, Coach Scott Field Show. Stay tuned for another exciting episode. And we appreciate uh, all the algorithms that go on out there. So like and follow our Coach Scott Field Show page. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're also on Anchor. So uh, appreciate all the love and support. But go out and uh, check Billy out because not only is he an outstanding man with high character this man puts content out there that matters great job billy thank you scott appreciate it coach appreciate you buddy all right